Mm-mm. No. Do they offer chemistry one or two in the summer here? Not that I know of. Yeah. If I do anything in the summer. Oh, hi. Hi. Let me mark you present. Okay. Um, I'm handing out the lab for next week. Okay. There it is. Is it on Blackboard? It's on Blackboard, yep. Let's see. Let's line this thing up. Hmm. Back it up some. There. See most of it. There we go. Now. Let's optimize. Enable, enable, enable. Audio. That's as high as it'll go. Okay. All right. Put as much glitter as possible. And a few. There's a, quite a few, actually. Oops. We'll, there there you are. Lost you for a second. Okay. So let's talk about uh, atomic structure. What does it have to do with periodicity? Define what periodicity is. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> we're going to start with what's the physical evidence for a common structure? Um, I think we've introduced part of this topic with. Um, the structure of the atom as protons, neutrons, electrons. And the, uh, the, the evidence for things that happen within the atom uh, are things that, as simple as fireworks. You know, why are some fireworks one color and others a different color? In fact, some colored fireworks are very difficult to produce. Probably the easiest to produce is yellow. Just about everything makes a yellow flame when it blows up in the sky. Or uh, white for that matter. So we need to characterize um, electromagnetic radiation, which is another is a fancy name for light. There are three characteristics that define electromagnetic radiation. <clears throat> Or, oh, you bringing a beaker back? Yeah, okay. but that might be hazardous. You want to you want to stick it in the prep room? Yeah. Do you have a key? 
Is it unlocked? No, it's unlocked. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, one is wavelength that we assign a, a lambda. Oh, I've got to do something. Chapter seven. Atomic structure and period is. <laughs> this is uh, spring nineteen. Okay. <clears throat> uh, one is lambda. One is frequency. Well, these are Greek letters. There's a small lambda, and this is a small nu, nu. And then there's um, speed, speed of light, which is a small c. If you know any two of these, you can derive the third one because they're related. They're, they're related by this formula. Yeah, that's, not, that's not a good thing. <clears throat> oh, not, well, it looks like a V. Depends on the font you're using. <clears throat> the speed of light in a vacuum is a constant. It's equal to that times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And these are SI units, meters for length, seconds for time. The wavelength is in meters, and the frequency is in hertz. But hertz is actually, when you start to do calculations, you can't use hertz because it won't cancel. Right? So we need to know what hertz means. And hertz means <laughs> cycles per second. And I'll define what that means in just a second, but cycles is dimensionless. Right? It's just a number. So actually, um, the units for nu are reciprocal seconds. It's one over, yes. And you start to do calculations. So if you if you uh, introduce um, meters for lambda and reciprocal seconds or one over seconds here, then you got the right units, meters per second. Okay. Now, what's a wavelength? Well. <clears throat> Light travels in waves, and um, if you measure the distance between two peaks, that's a wavelength. So long wavelengths will have a large number for lambda. Um, short wavelengths have a small um, number for the wavelength. And since we know that this relationship here says that light's a constant, so that means if you increase the wavelength, then the frequency has to go down. If you make the, the wavelength long, then the frequency is short. Or if you make the wavelength short, frequency gets big. Okay? That's inverse. Just like any product that's equal to a constant, the relationship of the two variables is inverse. So, what's a direct relationship? I'll just take your brain for a second. Right. Mathematically, what are we looking at? So, if we have a constant, it's equal to something divided by something. Right? That's always a direct relationship. Because in order to be constant, if that one goes up, this one better go up too. Okay. <clears throat> 
So we measure, um, let's look at the electromagnetic spectrum. This is all the light that we know anything about. That doesn't include special types of radiation that you'll see on the Star Trek on those shows and make those up to satisfy the uh, storyline. <laughs> this is the only type of electromagnetic radiation there is. All right here in this one chart. Notice first that the visible spectrum is a minor part of the whole. So if the wavelength increases from left to right, okay, we get blue is a short wavelength, red is a longer wavelength, and then just past red is infrared. So that's commonly known as heat waves. That's what you'll see in the in those red lamps they put over your french fries. Those generate lots of infrared. Because infrared is good at transferring energy and producing heat in several objects. <coughs> Microwaves come next. Okay, so you'll find those those wavelengths, a specific type of wavelength, um, you'll find that in your microwave oven. And there's some communication protocols that call for microwaves. Then radio waves, of course, if you turn on your FM radio or your AM radio, that's the range that you're going to find. There. So they're very long wavelengths. So if you get way out here, what's that, 10 to the fourth? 10,000 meters between one peak and the next. So very long wavelengths. If we go the other direction, right, we go from the blue, actually there's violet. Remember, everybody knows Roy G. Bitt? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and go violet. Okay. When it gets down in here, I can't tell the difference between indigo and violet. But apparently the last one is violet. So that means the one that's shorter wavelength for either is ultraviolet. And then uh, you can find some of those are the, the hazardous ones that you'll pick up in the summer if you spend too much time outside. <clears throat> uh, then you have uh, x-rays. Of course, we use those to uh, look for broken bones. Some other things. And then the really the most energetic of all are the gamma rays. They're very, very, very short wavelength. And another thing to recognize is as you go from right to left, the energy that's carried by the light it increases. A shorter wavelength means more energy. So these gamma rays are very, very high energy. So high that that's one of the doomsday scenarios is uh, uh, gamma ray bursts from objects in deep space. If they happen to be aimed right at the solar system and, and our planet, even though they might be millions of light years away, they're so powerful that and focused by the time they get to us, they could ionize our atmosphere. Chances are pretty slim, but if we're unlucky enough to uh, find ourselves in that beam, then we're in big trouble. Uh, okay, so wavelengths get longer to the right, and uh, frequencies get bigger to the left because they're inverse of one another. And if the frequency increases, you get more energy. If the wavelength decreases, you get more energy, and vice versa. Now we can calculate what that energy is. I don't know why that was right. We're converting electrical energy into uh, light by frying a pickle with <laughs> direct current. Okay, so how much energy is contained in one of these packets of light? That brings up the topic of What's the nature of light? You know, this this controversy has been going on for a couple of centuries. You know, is light a particle or is it a wave? Well, they never could come to any definite conclusion. 
no side could win. So it's both. Just depends on what you are investigating. If you're trying to uh, tune in your radio, lights awake. Uh, if you're uh, if you're uh, worried about being overexposed to the sun, then light the particle quantum. Because each quantum of light that hits your skin has the potential to knock electrons off. But that's what the UV does. When it knocks those electrons off, it can damage your DNA. And that's why we worry about overexposure of UV light can lead to cancer. No, no. Because it can damage your DNA. And then, then your cells start going haywire. Right? <laughs> if, you, if you damage the controlling molecule in each cell, then sometimes it loses its ability to control metabolism and the cells just go wild. That's cancer. Okay, so <clears throat> how do we calculate how much energy is contained? Well, a fellow by the name of Max Planck came up with that one for us. And the energy that's contained in a packet is this special constant named after Planck is Planck's constant times the frequency. So you know the frequency, reciprocal seconds, times uh, Planck's constant, then you can find out how much energy it is. And these are all SI units. So if this is in reciprocal seconds, and this is in joules, then whatever these units are, have to combine with that to give you the equivalent of joules. I think it's, uh, well, it's got to be joule seconds. And that number is, I guess you can memorize it if you're going to use it a lot, but I don't even remember it. It's like 10 to the minus 34, 6 point, 6 something, something. But it's in useful information. Okay. So you don't have to memorize it. There it is, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. That's Planck's constant. And uh, sometimes you, you don't have the frequency. More often than not, you're giving the wavelength of light. But that's okay, right? Because uh, if this is true, right, then we can solve for frequency, right? And just plug it right in there. So then, that's an H, not a K. Uh, so then we substitute this like that. Speed of light divided by wavelength times Planck's constant will give you the same answer. Okay. The only thing you have to remember is that's in meters per second. This has to be in meters, and that's a constant. So very often you're given units of measure for wavelength of light that are not meters, but nanometers is common. So. What's a nanometer? Well, it's 10 to the minus 9 meters. Okay. So if you're given nanometers, say our, our light uh, wavelength is 560 nanometers. All I'll do is just say, all right, times 10 to the minus 9 meters. There you go. So it's not that difficult to do enough of them, and you'll, you'll get comfortable with it. Okay. The photoelectric effect is the ejection of electrons from a surface when light of sufficient frequency shines on it. For example, when red light is directed at a metal surface, no electrons are ejected. However, when blue light, which has a higher frequency, is directed at the metal surface, electrons are ejected and a current flows through the wire as measured by the ammeter. Okay. So this, this quantum of energy Quantum just means packet of energy for a photon. Has to be of sufficient energy, e equals constant times frequency, has to be enough energy to cause uh, an electron to be ejected from the surface. And the minimum amount of energy 
This is not part of your lesson. I'm just going to wow you with my knowledge. The minimum amount of energy that's required to knock off an electron, just barely get it loose, is called the work function. How much energy is required to do that? Anything extra is translated into uh, kinetic energy for the electrons. So use up whatever's required to get it loose, and then the rest of it goes into sending it to the next, to the opposite electrode. So you can measure the current. <clears throat> so this photoelectric effect was adequately explained, mathematically proven by Albert Einstein. In fact, Everybody associates Albert Einstein with E equals MC squared, right? Okay. That's the one that got him the Nobel Prize. But we might as well give him credit for this one, too. This is uh, a relationship that tells us um, that gives us a quantitative expression for the uh, dual nature of light. It's not restricted to light, like E equals MC squared is valid for any mass traveling at actually any speed. If it's traveling at the speed of light, of course, then that's the energy associated with that mass. Um, or if you're converting part of the mass of an atomic bomb, which is what happens when it blows up, some of that mass is converted into energy. And the amount of mass that you lost in the process can be quantified by that expression. Right? If, we're, if our um, balances were accurate enough, and some of them are, you could measure a change in mass during a chemical reaction too. So if you, uh, for instance, if it was exothermic, gave up heat, then you should have lost some energy, I mean some mass, in the process of converting from reactants to products. Now that flies in the face of what law of conservation of mass. For most reactions, the change of mass uh, from reactants to products is negligible. So. For most purposes, the, uh, the equality of reactants and products, as far as mass goes, is still valid. I'm just making the point that uh, anytime you are producing energy or consuming energy, um, you're converting it into mass. Now, if we have, uh, if we're traveling slower than the speed of light, at some other velocity, say, a certain percentage of light, like ten percent then um, that mass is only giving you, it's giving you less energy in the process. And the reason I mention that is there is a problem in your review document that approaches the topic of less than the speed of light as a calculation. So I'm just giving you a heads up. Okay. So. I'm so glad you Okay. Um, all matter, electromagnetic radiation and all matter, they're connected, they're related by this equation, which means that all matter has both um, particle properties and wave properties. You didn't know that you were a wave, did you? <laughs> by the time you get this big, this much mass, you are a very long way. But you really only have the wave properties when you're moving. So when I do this, I'm a wave. When I'm doing this, I'm not a wave. Okay, what's the evidence for uh, using electromagnetic radiation for the structure of the atom? We're going to approach that topic in terms of the spectrum of light. So uh, if you ever take a prism 
and uh, hold it just right in a bright sunny day, you'll get a spray across your sheet of paper or whatever you're shining on. And for all intents and purposes, it'll be a continuous spectrum. Everything that you see and everything you don't see is there. But if you take um, individual elements, and we're going to focus on hydrogen and excite them, they use an electric discharge in this uh, tube that's got hydrogen inside. And you put a uh, prism next to that one, you won't get a continuous spectrum. You'll get a series of four lines. Right? So that got people to think, you know, what's going on here? One makes continuous and one makes lines. So, is what, it like, what it looks like through a prism separates into a rainbow or a continuous spectrum consisting of colors from violet to red. When the light emitted by a hydrogen gas discharge tube is passed through a prism, a line spectrum results. This line spectrum consists of light at only four wavelengths in the visible region. Now the question is, what does that mean? How can you explain that? Well, we know light is an expression of the energy. So in order to get energy, some change has to happen somewhere. And over the years, the relationship between the energy of each one of those lines, because we know what the energy is from the formulas, for each one of those wavelengths, we can calculate the, the amount of energy. That amount of energy that's given off by that light, because it's carrying energy away from the atoms, is related to electron transitions. Electrons are moving from one energy level to another, just outside the nucleus, of course. So what's the relationship there? <clears throat> Well, the first key is that there are lines, which means there are only certain transitions that are allowed. Electrons can only move from here to here. They can't move continuously, just stop anywhere they want to. They have to move from various energy levels to various energy levels that are defined. And then, um, which means that the, those energy levels are quantized. That, that means they're not continuous. They're, I guess in today's age, you could call them digital. We normally think of digital as zeros and ones, right? It's either on or it's off. But that's binary digital. You can have other types of digitals. Right? Uh, in fact, uh, computer language, programming language, uh, they use hexadecimal, right? which is 16 levels. So more than one level is possible in computer language. Um, and you have various quantized levels around this atom. So you have a nucleus. Uh, and then you have levels here. And they get closer and closer as you go out. So there's your first level, second level, third level, fourth, fifth level. And the electrons are moving. They want to be in the lowest energy level, let's put it that way. So for hydrogen, you've only got one electron. And for hydrogen that's not excited, we call it in its ground state, is going to have that electron in the first energy level. If we add energy to it with electric uh, shock, or we heat it up, or we shine light of a particular wavelength on it, then it will jump from here to maybe one of these other levels. Right. That's because, let's, let's keep it simple. Let's say we're going to add energy. So there's H nu is energy. It's coming in here like that. Strikes that electron and kicks the electron off. It depends on how much energy is contained in that light beam as to which, where it goes. The more energetic this, the higher it goes. That takes more energy to get it from there to there. And then, when it comes back, 
that's when it gives up that energy. And we see it as light. So those quantized transitions mean that there are only certain wavelengths that are given off uh, in the process. We call it relaxation. Excitement going this way, relaxation going that way, gives off light. Uh, okay. All right, so <clears throat> we needed some way to express this and explain why. So when we say why, that automatically means a theory and a model. So uh, Niels Bohr, who's a, a Danish physicist, proposed his model. And he said his model was, he, he modeled his model after the solar system. He said the planets are moving in, in these orbits, right? They, they don't significantly change their orbits. Um, so like Mercury would be the first level, uh, Venus would be the second level, Earth would be the third level, and you could only move between those levels. So he modeled his atom after that, and he, he focused on the hydrogen atom for good reason. So we've got one proton and one electron. He knew that once you start adding more electrons, they interact, and that really muddies the water. I mean, all you need is two electrons in there, and things just go to pop in a hurry. So since this was his beginning model, he kept it simple. Just the hydrogen with one electron. <clears throat> and the lowest energy level, like I said before, is N equals 1. That also has another name in, in quantum mechanics, which is the, the way we understand atoms now. Uh, this is the principal quantum number. That, that, that's the first, and that means what energy level are you at? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Whole numbers, starting with one, going on up. So the lower the number, the lower the energy. Okay. So there, I tried to draw it as accurately as could. One to two is a pretty big jump. And what they're saying here is they've only shown you three of the wavelengths, right? The the jump between three and two, if the electron goes from three to two, it gives off a red light. If it happens to be at four and it drops to two, then it gives off this green light. And if it goes from five to two, it gives off that blue light, and they're missing one. That's because they're four wavelengths that are in the visible range. I'm not sure why. Uh, be that as it may. Uh, these represent the transitions, right? There's the, there's the N equals one layer level. And they're not showing you the nucleus, right? So don't stick that just like I have done in the past. And each transition gives a definite line. Now, this is not the only evidence. We can actually see it. When you see the, the continuous spectrum from the sun, it's really not continuous. If your optics are good enough, you can spread that out. What you'll see is not lines. You see this continuous spectrum. But you'll see blanks in there where there's no light. What's happening is in the uh, atmosphere of the sun, there is hydrogen, helium, various other elements, mostly hydrogen. Helium. And the light that's coming out from underneath has to go through that, get out. And what happens is the light of a particular wavelength is absorbed by that element. So it gives you a dark line spectrum. Okay. In fact, that is how helium was first discovered. It wasn't discovered on the Earth, it was discovered on the Sun. That's why they call it helium. For, for the sun. And then later on, we found it on the Earth. But um, that's another uh, strong bit of evidence for these energy transitions. Okay, so how do we calculate the energy for those transitions? As long as we know the energy, 
uh, that is uh, given off or absorbed by those transitions, we can convert that into a, a wavelength of light. Right? We have the formulas for it. So if we know how much energy is in that transition, like from, from the, say we go from a uh, uh, final of two here, and we start at five there. Then you just reduce that to whatever value it is, and multiply by this value, which is a constant. And you find out how much energy is. Then you can take the energy and equate it to uh, H nu, or H times C divided by lambda, and find out what the wavelength is. So these things are interchangeable and related. You don't have to memorize that one. It's in, it's in your uh, useful information. And it's probably, uh, I think it takes a little bit different form than that. Let me see. There it is. Uh, about two thirds of the way down in the middle, we've got uh, minus 2.178. Minus 2.178 times 10 to the minus 18. And then it has um, z squared over n squared. Notice this is not the delta. This is the energy for that level. So delta just means that you take the energy for that level and subtract the energy from the other level, and you find out what the delta is. So it's combined this one for one level into the delta by subtracting one from the other. Now notice that that z here uh, is the same z as atomic number. So if you're atomic number, this, this broadens the applicability of your formula from hydrogen to other elements. So if you have uh, helium, that'll be two. If you have lithium, it'll be three. Beryllium, it'll be four. The only restriction is it has to look like hydrogen. In other words, it can only have one electron. So if it's hydrogen, good. It's already got one electron. With helium, it's got to be an ion with only one electron left. Right? It starts with two, we get rid of one. If it's lithium, we got to get rid of two of them, so we only have one electron left. Otherwise, the formula won't work. Okay, but I'm throwing too much at you. I hope. So, <clears throat> for for this example, this is hydrogen. This is actually hydrogen because one is one proton. Right. So if you subtract, if you say. Uh, the N level here is five, and you want to go from five to two, then you say, this is five minus the one for two. So you just go out here like this and fill out this one for the second level, and then it becomes delta. And if you if you know your algebra, then you can reduce this in, you can factor out this uh, constant, and that leaves you with this part that's this minus that one, and z equals one. Okay, that's where that came from. I don't have slides that explain it very well. That's why I have to hammer that for a few minutes. <clears throat> okay, so here's an example. So for the, the hydrogen atom transition from five to two, we're going to get blue light, and remember, the greater the transition, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy, the bigger the frequency, okay? So in this case, we're going from five to two, so two is the final, five is the initial, and then we just reduce that to what its value is, multiply by this, and we get this value for joules. So that's the energy for that transition. 
that many joules. And then we can take that energy and equate it to h times speed of light divided by lambda, which is what we've done over here. And then that reduces, well, I think what we're doing is proof of concept. So this is the energy that you get from the transition. This is the energy you get from using the wavelength. So we stick the wavelength in here. Remember what I said, that's nanometers, so it's 434 times 10 to the minus 9. And 10 to the minus 9 reduces to 4.34 times 10 to the minus 7. Okay. So there's no mystery there. And if we do these calculations, we get the same, or roughly the same amount of energy uh, with either of the equations. Now, if we only had one of the equations, right, we had this energy, then we could stick the energy value in here and leave this one as our unknown and solve for the wavelength. Like any equation, if you know everything but one unknown, you can solve for it. Just need to practice it. And then, of course, what is this? Wednesday. Next Monday, we'll look at uh, reviews. Okay, back to the Bohr model. <clears throat> Okay, he's still insisting at this point that electrons travel in circular orbits. So what does that mean? What that tells me is that he's treating electrons as particles. Because his model set is modeled after planets. So the electrons are traveling in orbits like this. But he's calling them particles. And then as they move from one level to another, they either absorb energy or they give up energy depending on the transition. If they move from a lower level to a higher level, that means they have to absorb energy. Okay? But if they move from a higher to a lower energy, they're giving up energy. You can see it as light. Um, let's see. Okay, convention. If uh, See if I can relate this to our um, uh, exothermic and endothermic transitions. So if your if your atom is giving up energy right, in the form of light, then the transition is it's a negative value, right? So it should be negative because it's leaving the system. So let's see, how does that relate? If we're giving up light, then that, that means we've had a transition from one of these levels down to that level. So how can this be negative? If these values, these values would be something, uh, this would be x and y. So which one's greater and what sign are they? Well, as it turns out, we're using the reference, our zero point is out here at infinity. In other words, we're starting from an ion. The electrons out here free. That's at its zero energy relative to the atom. Right? So as it gets closer, it gets more negative because its energy level is decreasing until it gets down to whatever ground state. So if it's hydrogen, of course, it'll be down here. That will have uh, given up a certain amount of energy that's negative. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to help you develop some intuition as to what the sign will be on the energy. Now, if we if we add energy here, right, then we're going to promote that electron out to some level. If we put enough energy into it to go out to infinity, we've created an ion, and that's called ionization energy. That's going to be a positive amount. You're adding energy to the system, even though you're losing an electron. Okay? So, 
This is more negative than that one. Right? So if you go from here, the initial, to the final, right? uh, initial, it's supposed to be final minus initial. Okay. So if initial is out here, and it's negative, they're both negative to start with, then the initial energy is going to be less than this one. So that means this combination of positive is less than that one, and the difference is negative. Maybe I better quit on it. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> So what's wrong with Bohr's model? Most models, particularly when they, they're right at the, the beginning stages of understanding a system, have some serious flaws that don't come out until later. Well, as it turns out, um, Bohr's model has applications, but it has some flaws. First flaw is that electrons don't move around the around the uh, nucleus in circular orbits. Um, if they did move in circular orbits, then we could find them. If they, were, if they were particles moving around, we could find out where they are, or that we can. So, the conventional wisdom is that uh, electrons, when they move in their energy levels, behave more like waves. In other words, if you got your nucleus here and you got your orbital there, that's your electron. It's a wave at that energy level. <clears throat> and even that's not. A really good explanation. Eventually, we we have to use statistics and do probabilities. And that's where quantum mechanics comes in. Quantum mechanics is is basically, it's basically all statistical. It's really hard to, to be intuitive about quantum mechanics. You got to be a math nerd to understand. It. Okay, what color of light is emitted when an excited electron and hydrogen atom falls from? Uh, five, four, three. Okay, we have those examples, right? Uh, one's green, that's the one in the middle. Uh, one's red, and one's blue. Right? There's a fourth one, but they conveniently left that one out, so we only have to deal with those three. So which one's going to have the longest wavelength, lowest energy? The transition from three to two, right? The shorter the jump, the less energy. So this one should be the red. This one is in the middle, it should be the green. This one's the bigger jump, it should be the blue because it's the highest energy. Okay. And you can calculate what they are, or you can be given the value. Uh, so there's our longest wavelength, is that shortest transition. Now, what I was getting at um, with electrons as particles, we can't find out where they are. That question was answered by uh, Bernard Heisenberg, called his uncertainty principle. And it's got some pretty heavy duty math in it, but we shrunk it down to say that uh, there are two things that can be measured about any moving object. One is, how much does it weigh? What's its mass? Right. Well, actually, they're, okay, back up. Yes, mass, but velocity together. This term right here is called um, is called momentum. That's the Greek letter rho. It's equal to mass times velocity. That's not new. That's velocity. So the momentum is taken together. And usually that translates into velocity because when something's moving, uh, unless it's moving a significant 
percentage of the speed of light, its mass is constant. So we're really talking about the velocity. So you can know something about the velocity of an object, and then you can measure its position, that's what X stands for. Where is it? Well, um, what we mean by the delta is, how big is the uncertainty? So since this is related to this value here, and they're all constants, right? Pi is an irrational number. We just had pi daylight. Was it last week? Or maybe the week before? Pi day. And this is a constant. So if these two times each other are related to the constant in, in this form, either equal to or greater than, then if one goes up, the other goes down. Right? So if you know this one, if you can make this one really small, like where is it? This one goes way up. Right? So the uncertainty and the momentum is huge if you know where it is. And if you if you know its momentum or how fast is it going, then you can't really find out where it is. And it's more significant the smaller the particle. Right? For something as big as you and me, the uncertainty is uh, uh, is greater than h four pi, uh, and neither factor is significant. So that's why for big objects. You can tell where they are and how fast they're moving. But for very small objects, like electrons, you cannot know both. That's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Now, you don't have to know what this is. We're just making a, a using it to explain something about the uh, atom. That's the Greek letter psi. Looks like a pitchfork. <clears throat> and uh, um, if we know the value of this function, which is an expression of the wave function, and you square it, then it gives you a, a probability of finding, because we don't know exactly where, it gives you the probability of finding an electron if you get the region around an atom. So for, um, let's see, we have done, uh, yeah, earlier, didn't we do um, electron configurations around atoms? 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p. We have done that. Must be this chapter. <laughs> okay, in that case, um, I'm going to skim over this because the explanation requires some prior knowledge of, of that other stuff. Ah. Okay. I'll get to it right at the class. Um, okay, so all it says is, well, where is it most likely to find the electron? So we square that wave function, and it tells you that for this particular orbital, um, the wave function says it's going to be spherical, and most of it is going to be very close to the nucleus. Okay, that's all it says. Um, of course, the distribution is not going to be right at the nucleus, right? because uh, even though you've got a positive negative attraction, you can only get so close to the nucleus before other forces kick in and say, no, that's too close. This is my space, that's your space. <clears throat> um, it says something about the, the size of the orbital. Right? So for the hydrogen, this very low level orbital, um, that probability that we've expressed as the square of psi uh, really encompasses about 90% of the probability of finding an electron. Now, with probabilities, 
you could just as easily say that there's a 10% probability that uh, the electron, that electron will be over there. Right? But it's, it's a low probability. I have a professor that was a cell physiology professor. He was kind of on the edge. But he used to say, you know, there's a very small but significant quantifiable probability that all the air in this room will migrate to that corner and will suffocate. Okay. He was right. It just would probably never happen. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. Now, so now we're going to get to the quantum numbers. Those numbers that are used to uh, define the energy and various other characteristics of an electron around an atom. These are our quantum numbers. There are four. We talked about the first one already. That's the principal quantum number. And it defines uh, both the size of the orbit and the energy of the orbit. Right. So if one is here, then two is out here. So it makes it bigger. But it's also at a higher energy level. So that's what N refers to. The L quantum number refers to the angular momentum. Okay. Which means the shape of the orbital. Right. So that one that we just looked at was spherical. Anytime it's, and it was a 1s orbital, so all the s orbitals are spherical. That's the shape of the orbital. And as we go, just remember that, uh, keep this in mind. This number, it's like a, um, a tree, on, on inverted. So we got n up here, but you can have multiple levels of l underneath it. So the n can be uh, one, two, three, four, on the whole numbers. The l will take one of these, whatever the n happens to be, and it will be zero, one, two, up to n minus one. So the number of possible l's that you can have in an n depends on what the n is. So if you have n equals 3, you can have 0, 1, and 2. Just have 3 levels of L under level 3. If you n is 2, then you can only have 1, 0, and 1. If you have 1, then you can only have 0. That's it. You can have as many L levels as the value of your n is, starting with 0. Okay? The next one. I do. I've been accidentally punching buttons. There we go. The M sub L is the magnetic quantum number. This one refers to the orientation of the orbital. You know, some of them are, are kind of lobe shaped and they, they'll point off that direction. And then others of the M sub L will point off this direction. Or sometimes they'll point this direction because they have a donut. So it defines the orientation of the orbital in space. Now these are based upon the L's, and they can be minus L um, whole numbers up to plus L. So if it were two L's, then we can have. Minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. For the two. If it's one, it's just minus one, zero, plus one. If it's zero, that's it, zero. <laughs> you can't have a minus zero or a plus zero. It'll work out better once we get all this stuff down here and then start using them. And then the last one is the spin. This one is always plus one half or minus one half. 
That's the easiest one to punch. So at any one of these L levels, you can have a plus one half or a minus one half. Okay. Uh, that's all. So this is an expression of say, you start with n equals one, you can only have one L. That's it. And you can only have one M spell and of course two spins. If we start with n, we can have two L's. So the M sub L's could be zero for this one or minus one zero plus one. And it just it just blooms like that. Oh, um, for the L's, zero, one, two. Let's say let me expand this to three, because that's that's not all that's all we're going to use. But theoretically, and quantum mechanically, you can have a bunch, and this goes up to uh, n minus one. Now, <clears throat> when we start writing electron configurations, that is. Where do the electrons go when we add them to the elements? So if we say we're going to have a number of 28, Z equals 28, that means the neutral atom is going to have 28 electrons. So we've got to put them in there, in the atom. And we basically start here and work our way down until we get to 28, adding electrons as we go. So where do they go? Well, we need a shorthand way of writing. The energy level is fine. One, two, three, four. That's okay. But if we say uh, one zero or two two, that's a little hard to handle. So what we've done is we get we put letters, assigned letters to these right here. S, P, e, D, and F. They can go higher than that. We have G and H. But for our purposes, that's all we need. So that's why, for hydrogen, you only need first energy level, first L number, and then you only have one electron. So that's hydrogen, 1s1. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Okay. I know we can lead into uh, we can lead into a lab time today, which is good because we're going to need it. But if you need to break, go ahead. Because we're recording the whole thing, you're not going to miss anything. For the principal quantum number, n equals three. Okay, so let's look at this one. Determine the number of allowed subshells. And they're calling L a subshell. That means that they're calling this a shell. Okay. So how many subshells can we have? A equals three. Three, right? So you can have as many subshells as the number on your shell. So we can have zero, one, and two. Okay. Questions? Or is it just getting you like a ton of bread? <laughs> so there's there's the first one, second one, third one. And if we assign the letters to each one of these. Then there's the S for zero, the P for one, and the D for two. S, D, D. Now, where are we headed with this? Well, the organization of the periodic table is not an accident. The S orbitals are being filled with these two. The P orbitals are being filled with these guys. The D orbitals are being filled here, and the F orbitals are being filled here. Okay, that's the overall organization of the table. So once we learn how to do this, 
We can write the electronic configuration of anything on this table as long as we know where it's located, which order we need to. And we don't have to we don't have to go through the drudgery of you know writing the whole thing out in, in some kind of order. And I'll give you that order too. Just a second. What if L equals two? So we move down here and we say, okay, now we're two. What are the magnetic quantum numbers for that order? Well, with two, we can have minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. We can have five. Okay. And then remember, each one of these can have plus one or minus one, which represents an electron. This level can have two electrons there, two there, two there, two there, two there. As long as one of them is plus one half, the other is minus. So if you say uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, we have room for 10 elements at that point. And this is the d orbital. So notice 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And 10 electrons, 10 elements. <clears throat> Okay. An S orbital has a spherical shape with the nucleus at the center. So the shape is the angular momentum quantum number. So that's an S shaped spherical. I guess I don't know if that coincidence. Who knows? Uh Okay, so you can have s orbitals at these various energy levels. Right? Each energy level can have an s. If it's one, it's just this s. If it's two, then it's another s at the next highest energy level. And it might be spherical from the outside, but the structure on the inside says for the one s level, it's just this one sphere. For the two s level, it has one node right here. You know what a node is? A node means that uh, whatever property you're looking at drops to zero. Right? There's no probability of finding an electron at that node. But there is probability here and here. So that's what they're representing here. For n equals two, I mean n equals three, excuse me, one, two, three, you're gonna have two nodes, right? So for that s orbital, you're going to have that node and that node. The two p x orbital is in the shape of a figure eight along the x axis. So the, um, the p orbital shape is like a dumbbell, right? But the direction, the magnetic quantum number says. I need three dimensions, that's going back into the board. So you can have one that's X, it would be like this. Right? You can also have one pointing this way. Or you can have one going back into the board on that, that axis. So you can have three possibilities there. So here's your, your P orbitals. And their directions, the magnetic quantum number says minus one, Zero plus one. X, Y, Z. That's what they're saying. One's X, one's Y, one's Z. And of course, each one of these can have two electrons in it. So for the P orbital, you can have one, two, three orbitals, two, four, six electrons. Okay. P orbitals are being filled over here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. We're filling the P orbitals over here. That's why they're six. The 2 p y orbital is in the shape of a figure eight along the y axis. And then there's the c. The 2 p z orbital is in the shape of a figure eight along the z axis. Okay, so various ways of representing them. The 
3 dx squared y squared orbital has a cold shape that lies in the xy plane and is aligned along the x and y axes. So now we're getting really weird. And nobody's ever seen these. This is all calculated you know, probabilities. The 3 dxy orbital has a cold relief shape that lies in the xy plane and bisects the x and y axes. The 3 dxz orbital has a cold relief shape that lies in the xz plane and bisects the x and the z axes. They are really weird. The 3 dyz oh, orbital has One a cold relief shape that lies in the yz plane and bisects the y and z axes. The 3D's action yeah. orbital is shaped like a PZ orbital with a donut of electron density around the center. It is aligned with the Z axis. Okay. So it can go from sublime to ridiculous. There's your five orbitals minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. Two electrons each, 10 possible elements that you're building. Then the F even gets worse. Right, so we're not going to bother with those. But, okay, let's say uh, F is 3, right? So F would be minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 3. Plus three. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Times 2 is 14. That's 14 elements. Yeah. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, 14. The lanthanides. 14 filling the F orbital. Um, okay, so why do we need a plus one half and a minus one half? Well, the Pauli exclusion principle says that in any given atom, no two electrons can have the same set of four quantum numbers. I mean, they can have all the same here, 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 whichever one you choose, here, there, there. But when you get down to here, you got to give them a plus half or minus half. Because they can't have the same set. Right. They could differ up here, you know, they'd be a different horrible. But if they have the same set here, here, and here, at least one of these has to be different from the other. That's the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay, so what's a polyelectronic atom? Just means there's more than one. More than one electron that you have to deal with. The only monoelectronic atom is hydrogen. It it's a neutral state. You can have monoelectronics if they're ions. And we talked about those earlier. Right? Uh, helium plus one, lithium plus two, beryllium plus three. Uh, are all monoelectronic, but they're not. Atoms taking bigger ions. Um, and uh, since the Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle tells us that we really don't know where they are, we cannot quantify the repulsive effects because negatives repel one another. So if you have more than one electron, then those are going to start pushing on each other. But since we don't know where they are, we can't quantify how much that push is. So how do the electrons go into the atom as we start building, adding protons and electrons to accompany them? In a hydrogen atom, all subshells for each end are at the same energy. For multi-electron atoms, the subshells are spread apart due to interactions between electrons. Okay, so as you start adding more electrons, we have been able to uh, probabil probabilistically determine their energy levels. We just can't tell where they are. And what happens is, as they interact with one another, the more of them you get, the more shifted the energy levels of these uh, orbitals become. Uh, in such a way that eventually, this 3D orbital, which is supposed to be at a lower energy than the 4, actually moves up above the 4S. Now, why is that significant? significant because 
Electrons, when they go into an atom, as you add them, they go in and occupy the lowest possible energy level available. So if you've got electrons down here, the next level is where it goes. It has to be the next lowest energy level. So if we start putting electrons in there and these energy levels begin to shift, then that means when the 3D gets up here, anytime we add electrons, then they're going to go in here first. Then to the 3D. So it kind of messes with your mind. But don't fear, we have a way of dealing with it. Okay, before we do the penetration effect, there's a there's a chart in useful information that tells you how electrons go in. It's on page 26. So if we okay. if we start off with one S, that's all it can be. Then at the two level, you can have two S and two P. Right? Because with two, you can have two subshells. With three, you can have three. Okay. With four, you can have five. Uh, four, excuse me, four. Yeah. And then with five, we could have we could have five if we wanted to. The reason I don't go out here to five G is that's theoretical. And we don't have any G orbital being filled out here. Now, you could occupy a G orbital if you promoted an electron. That's possible. But ground state, neutral atoms, we only need to go to five. And then uh, six. Like that. So how do they fill? Well, you fill this one first. Fill that one second. Third, fourth. Then six, you're going from three P to four S, then we'll go back to three D, four P, five S. So on that diagonal, you're filling all those. And that's what that, that color thing shows you how to do. So what does that mean? When you start building an atom, uh, let's take one that's that goes up through uh, maybe 4P. So 4P, you can say arsenic. Arsenic is 33 electrons. Okay? So if we take them in order, energy order, 1S, 2S, 2P, 3S, 3P, 4S, 3D. And then we just start putting electrons in until we run out. So S's can only have two electrons. They only have one level. So we can have plus minus, plus one half, minus one half, two. All the S's have twos. P's can have six. Right? Six elements, six electrons. So we have six here. So what is that? Six and or ten, that's twelve. So we have oops, 21 left. Okay. Yeah, 21. So this one has six, two. These can have 10 because they have five subshells, two each. So let's see, two, four, 10, 18, 20, 30. And we have three left. So where do we go from 3D? We go to 4D. And then we put those last three electrons in the people. So that's our electronic structure. Now, while I'm here, I might as well show you the shorthand. Right? So notice, uh, as we're adding electrons, we're like marching through different elements. We're headed to arsenic. Shorthand is you go backwards. Until you get to the nearest 
noble gas. So we go backwards, that means when we get down to the end of this period, we have to go back to this one. So argon 18 is our core. And then beyond that, 2, 4, 10, 18 here. Beyond that, we can write what's left over. So that's another way to write the electronic structure for arsenic. We use argon as our core and then whatever's left over. Now, if we go argon, then notice that this is the fourth level one, two, three, four. So 4s1, 2. These are, are, this is not 4, this is 3. So you have to remember that. These D's, these might be 4s, but the first level of D that you have is a 3. So this is 3D1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, or D10. And then you have P, 4, then you're back to 4. 4P, four 1, 2, 3. So if you know your periodic table, you can write the structure just from following that. Oops. Okay, penetration effect. Um, you remember on those those tables where we showed you the nodes? Anybody else need to take a break? I can stop for a minute. Yeah, okay. Let me pause it so you don't have to, when you look at it on the Blackboard, it won't be. Should I go back and talk about it? So it'll be complete. <laughs> okay. Here's what here's what we missed. Discussion of the history of the periodic table. You look that up in your book. Alpha principle just means put your electrons in in a definite order. Hund's rule, which means that the maximum number of electrons go into these uh, same level subshells, spin up. Then you since you have four, and after you get one in each, you can put the fourth one in there like that. <coughs> now for valence electrons. Valence electrons are basically those electrons that are available for bonding. Okay. So we have to decide what constitutes a valence electron for oxygen. Well, the ones that are at the same principal quantum number. Okay. So this one has six valence electrons. It only has two core electrons. How do we find those on a periodic table? We just go over here. There's oxygen. What did I say, six? Yeah, that's right, six. So at this level, you got two S's and four P's, our valence electron. Let's see. Uh, how many valence electrons would you have for calcium? One, two, only two for calcium. How about for carbon? One, two, three, four. Four valence electrons for carbon. How about noble gases? How many valence electrons do they have? Zero. The reason being that this orbital is completely filled and it's happy. It doesn't want to play bond with anybody. That's why they call it noble gases. They're above bonding. Now we've forced some bonding with these down here. Those guys up there, no way. In fact, argon is Latin for lazy or sluggish. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so here's what I showed you earlier. The uh, shells that are being filled can be identified in the table. These are all S filling. These are all P filling. 
So the representative elements are S's and P's. And the transition metals are D's. The lanthanides and the actinides are F all those. And there's how they fill. Right? That's in your useful information. So let's see if we can do a couple of these. How about sulfur? Well, you go find out how many electrons does it have? 16. And you put in your orbitals, however many you need. We just say, we may not need all of them, but we'll put it in. And then you start filling them up. So two can go in the S, six can go in the P, so that's 10. We need six more. There's two, we need four more. Like that. Okay? Oh, shorthand. Right? For sulfur, shorthand would be we go backwards until we get to neon. And then neon would be ten. That's your core. So ten would be up here. Then we have three s two, three p four. So we have six valence electrons for sulfur. Bearing is a big, right? Because it's way out here, fifty six. So that shorthand notation is valuable. You just go backwards until you get to xenon, xenon 54, and then bearing is filling the s orbitals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6s, 6s1, 6s2. That's bearing. And that's why this group, when they form ions, they form plus one because they only have one valence electron. You ever got that electron, and you have plus one charge. These have two valence electrons, so they prefer getting rid of two electrons. Make it plus two. Okay. And you don't have to worry about your rope It's not well behaved anyway. When you get down to so these guys, the, the way the orbitals feel is kind of strange. So we're not going to deal with the, with the F orbitals anyway. There are some discrepancies in the Ds. And uh, We'll get to those later. What I mean by that is, as you fill the D orbitals, you would normally say D1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Then you get up to 10. But as it turns out, um, how many D orbitals are there? Five. Right? right? So when you go up to, you're going to have an S over here. Because you go S and then D. So if you start adding like that, like that, like that, like that, then when you get to that point, what it usually does is for that element, it steals one of these. It's right there. So it's, it's S1 and D5. The reason being that the, the uh, energy balance is better if you have. These orbitals half fill all the way over. Then when you go to the next one, it puts the next electron back over here. So that happens. Uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, here, chromium steals one of the S's and makes uh, D5. And copper steals one of the S's and makes a D10. So this is a D10, that's a D10. Only this one has uh, S2, and this one has S4. Just giving you a heads up. It's like anything. We start with the rules, and then we start correcting them. <laughs> okay, periodic trends. So we can use the periodic table to help us understand uh, how certain characteristics vary from one side to the other. And the first one we're going to look at is ionization energy. Next one is electron affinity. And the last one is atomic radius. So we have to define what do we mean by ionization energy. Ionization energy starts with an element. 
in the gas phase. Why do we start in the gas phase? Because gas atoms are virtually independent of one another. There's no interaction. And when we're looking at electron transitions, we don't want any type of interaction between the elements that will influence the measurements that we're making on that one electron transition. If it was a liquid or solid, it would be in some type of uh, association with other atoms, and that would just screw up our measurements. So it starts with a gas phase, then we add energy, and we get a singly charged gas ion plus a free electron. And that free electron, like I showed before, is at infinity. It has left the atom completely. Now this is the bill. And how much energy does it take right, to do that? Right. For the first ionization energy, it takes a certain amount. And with our convention, it's going to be a positive value. Right, because we're adding energy to the atom, the system, which means it's positive. And it takes a certain amount of energy to remove uh, an electron. And it's usually in terms of uh, so many kilojoules per mole. But once you've got this one, you can do it again. As long as there are enough electrons, you can get, a, you can get an I2. Right? You can kick another electron off, you just start here. But you're trying to remove an electron from a positive ion. So you might guess it's going to take more energy. Now for magnesium, we've only got two valence electrons. And that is for a little. Once you get to the third electron, where are you at? You're in the core. Core electrons are analogous to these guys, they don't want to give up electrons. So it takes a lot of energy. So we're jumping from 1,400 to 7,000. That's a big jump. That's characteristic of any ionization energy sequence for an element. Once you get into the core, the amount of energy jumps way up. And there's a chart talking about that here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so what are the trends in the periodic table? Well, um, uh, let's see. Go across a period from left to right. Now we're talking about only the first ionization energies. Going from left to right, the, the amount of energy increases, right? it takes more energy. To get rid of, to remove the first electron out of each one of these. The main reason for that is simply uh, atomic number. You're adding more protons. Plus, you're staying, you're in the same energy level. So as you add protons, you're falling on those electrons that much harder. And it takes more energy to get the first electron removed. Now, how about a trend up and down? Uh, up and down, the electrons are easier to remove as you go down. The reason for that is the energy level. Energy level is higher number, which means the electrons are farther from the nucleus. Right? They don't feel the nuclear pull as much in the outer orbit down here as we do up here. Plus, what do you have between you and the nucleus? A whole bunch of negative charges. They do what we call shielding. They shield you from the positive charge in the nucleus. Okay. So those two effects combine to decrease the ionization energy as we go down. So the converse, ionization energy increases as you go up and it increases as you go to the right. So from lower left to upper right, the ionization energy, the first ionization energy, increases. Lower left, upper right. Uh, 
let's see. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. I mean, it's instructive, but it's not essential. Oh, okay. Um, I think we better go back. So what's happening as we go from left to right? Well, we expect going from lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon oxygen, carbon nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, from left to right, it would be a step increase, energy increase, as you go from up like that. But notice as you get to beryllium, it goes back down to boron, and then it goes back up again to it gets nitrogen, then it goes back down again, it goes back up. So something happening between beryllium and boron. What's happening there is um, you're generally increasing, but when you get to the P orbitals, it's taking less energy to get from the P's because of their, uh, they don't have as much penetration. They don't send as much of their electron density closer to the nucleus as the S's do. So we go from here to here and we drop down some. Then we start climbing back up because we're in the P's. But when you get to nitrogen and oxygen, nitrogen 7, oxygen 8, You've got uh, 1s2, 2s2, and then 2p, 3, 1, 2, 3. So we have four, we have three electrons here, like that, like that, like that. Then here, we got four electrons out here, like four, five, six, seven, eight. Like that, 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 and that. Okay. It takes a certain amount of energy to remove that electron. But you've got repulsion here. Makes it easier. So the energy drops back down for oxygen. It goes up to nitrogen, and it drops back down to oxygen. And then it goes back on, on back up. You start out with that. So that is a potential explanation for the discrepancies. Okay. All right. Now, when you've got when you've got sodium and chlorine are in the same period, we can use our trend. And since they're so far apart, the trend generally works. Sodium should have take less energy to remove that first electron than chlorine does. This will be to the right. Okay. More energy for chlorine. Lithium and cesium. Now we're in the same family. So which one takes more energy? Is that the way it's worried? Yeah. More energy to remove the first electron. Because those uh, valence electrons are closer to the nucleus. The lower energy takes more energy to get a boost. How about the second ionization energy? Which has the larger second? Okay. In that case, we say, all right, here's lithium. It takes a certain amount of energy to remove the first electron. Then the second electron takes a little bit more. We're still valence electron. But beryllium, oh, excuse me. Um, no, I was going in the wrong direction. Lithium, only one electron. Right, go back to helium. Now you're in the core. So the second electron from lithium should take more energy than the second electron from beryllium. Because it's removing one and two valence electrons. Did I confuse anybody? Uh, only myself. <laughs> it's the concept of are you removing a valence electron or a core electron? That's the key. Now, this chart shows you. Um, so these are in the order of. Uh, Number, atomic number. So sodium, magnesium, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur. On that line, you're just adding one more proton and one more electron. So sodium only has one valence electron. Try to remove a second one, you're into the core. Whereas magnesium, you can take two before you get to the core. Aluminum, you can take three before you get to the core. 
once you get into the core, this core for each one of these has a different number of protons. So notice as you get into the core, the core, the first core electron does take more each time because you've got more protons. But as long as you're in the valence, um, there's a fairly orderly increase in the amount of energy. That's the whole point of that chart. Electron affinity. This was ionization energy. So you start with a neutral gas atom and you remove an electron. How much energy does it take? For electron affinity, you start with that same neutral atom. But in this case, you say, how much attraction is there for an electron? Put the electron on this side. And we're still dealing with gases. So the question here is, how much energy do you get back when that electron goes from infinity to ground state? Okay. So the values here are going to be negative because you're getting energy out as that electron drops in. So electron affinity. As you go across a period from left to right, the electron affinity becomes more negative, which means you get more energy back. That is, the attraction is stronger. If the electron affinity, the energy is negative, then the negative gets bigger as you go from left to right. In other words, chlorine is more strongly attracted to an electron than lithium is. That's all that means. Uh, and if you go um, down a group, go down a group, the uh, the affinity becomes more positive. So if it, if you get more strong affinity from left to right, more negative number, then you get more negative number from bottom to top. So fluorine has the strongest attraction for electron of this family. It becomes more negative that way, more negative this way, stronger attraction. So actually it's the same trend as ionization energy, more left, upper right, the affinity. The affinity increases, but the value itself becomes more negative, simply because as you do this, you get energy back out. As this drops from infinity down to its core, then you get this out and the bigger that is, the more negative the number, just based on convention. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about is atomic radius. So atomic radius is, I thought they would define it. The atomic radius is, is kind of hard to nail down because um, unlike the first two where you're dealing with a gas, 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 atomic radius, it could be a gas or it could be uh, an atom in a covalent relationship like oxygen, O2, or it could be um, a crystalline solid. And then you have to, uh, like a metal, like a metal, so because metal is going to be neutral uh, in their crystal lattice. <clears throat> so it's a little more difficult to get a handle on atomic radius, be that as it may. In general, as you go across the period from left to right, the atomic radius decreases. So the size of the atom decreases from left to right, and that's simply due to the fact that you're adding more protons. Every time you add a proton, it pulls harder on the electrons and shrinks the size of the atom, left to right. And as you go down in a period, you're adding energy levels, which means bigger. So it gets bigger this way. 
and commerce, it gets smaller that way, simply because of the energy levels. So now the trend is the lower left up to right, things get smaller. Now these trends hold fairly well for the representative elements, these guys and these guys. When you cross the, the, uh, the great divide <laughs> through, the, through the transition metals, things don't work quite as well. So that's why this chart only shows representative elements. The S orbitals and the P orbitals. When you get the D orbitals in there, um, things don't work quite as well. So we have the biggest one down here, cesium, smallest one up here, fluorine. Okay. And very often, uh, charts will leave off the noble gases. But in this case, they, they've added one. And notice that neon here blooms out a little bit. Whereas argon is pretty much the same, maybe a little bit smaller. So which is the larger atom? Sodium and chlorine? Left to right, we shrink the chlorine. Sodium is going to be the largest, chlorine will be the smallest. Lithium cesium, they're in the same family. Cesium's lower. So it's going to be the bigger one. So let's think about the individual orbitals. The 1s orbital in the hydrogen atom occupies a certain space. It's got one proton in there pulling on it. Whereas lithium has three protons pulling on the 1s. It also has a 2s, but it's pulling on the 1s. So this 1s orbital should be smaller than the hydrogen one is orbital, simply because lithium has more protons. So that was going to be the largest one. Which one's the lowest energy? When you think of the energy levels in an atom, the closer it gets to the nucleus, the lower its energy. So the lithium one is orbital is going to be lower energy because it's smaller, shrunk closer to the nucleus, which makes it lower energy. At room temperature, the metallic element in the lithium exists as a solid crystal. Metallic crystals behave like a three-dimensional array of cations surrounded by a sea of electrons. A molybdenum crystal can be used to estimate the atomic radius of molybdenum atoms. The distance between nuclear centers and molybdenum is 278 feet. So the atom radius is estimated to be 139 feet. Notice he said estimated. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know exactly. You can get some pretty good estimates, uh, depending on how regular the structure is. If, it's, if it is a bona fide crystal, X-ray crystallography will give you a pretty good idea uh, of the uh, arrangement of the atoms in, in that crystal. At room temperature, the halogen element chlorine exists in the gas phase. Gas phase molecules are relatively far apart since gases have low density. Molecules move in straight lines until they collide with container halls or other molecules. The diatomic chlorine molecule can be used to estimate the atomic radius of chlorine atoms. The distance between nuclear centers and chlorine is 199 meters, so the atom radius is estimated to be 100 meters. I mean, that word. <coughs> the halogen element chlorine exists in the gas phase. Gas phase. That works as long as you. Uh, believe what he tells you about the other numbers. Right. I don't know how they do that. So, arrange oxygen, fluorine, sulfur, which is being given away. Ionization energy. Uh, so, lower left, upper right. So, we have oxygen, fluorine, sulfur. Oxygen, fluorine, sulfur. So this one's lower to the left. It should be the least, the lowest ionization energy, and oxygen is above it, and fluorine is to the right, so you got sulfur, oxygen, fluorine to be the, the, from lower, from less to more ionization energy. Atomic radius should be just the opposite, because the trend is opposite. Uh, 
Okay. The chemistry of an element is determined by the valence electrons. How many of them are there? What kind are they? Are they S? Are they S electrons? Are they P electrons? Or are they mixed? Carbon is a weird one. You start getting into carbon chemistry, you're talking about organic chemistry. Uh, we know that carbon uh, forms a regular arrangement with hydrogen. That's the end of that. So it's a tetrahedron. But if you consider the um, 2s2, 2p2, and then of course 1s is the uh, is the core, but the valence electrons are these four. These two S's are not the same electrons as these two P. So why do we get a regular shape? They would have to be equal. But we get around that one with uh, like tweaking of the theory. So we we take we take those uh, two and we create a third. Call an sp3 orbital. So the two sp3 orbital is symmetrical. That's just a. If you go to organic, then you get a whole crop full of that stuff. Um, electronic configurations can be determined from the way the periodic table is organized. We've done that. Uh, there are special names for certain groups, right? We, we've done those already, I think, right? when you did that uh, extra credit exercise. You know, these are noble gases, these are halogens, these are calcogens after oxygen, and these are nitrogens after nitrogen. These are alkaline metals, these are alkaline earths. Uh, these are transition metals, these are lanthanides, these are actinides. Those are the only names I'm Oh, there we go. Now, this table has um, the group names, group numbers, as 1A, 2A, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8A. Whereas this is a modern version, and it just numbers from left to right, 1, 2, 3, right on across. The advantage to the 1A through 8A version is. If you know the number in front of that A, you know how many valence electrons there are. 1A, 2A, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's one of the advantages to this system. Then down here, they would have some convoluted others, Bs, A to Bs. Um, we're kind of getting these things backwards. All right, you know where the metals are. To the left of this jagged line, those are the metals. It's the non metals. And then there are a few that are really close to this line silicons, romanium, arsenic, antimony, lurine. Those guys are known as uh, metalloids. Depending on what environment they're in, they might act like a metal, they might act like a non metal. Okay, there were a bunch of slides in here that were uh, specific to the various groups, and I knew that it would take forever to get through them, so we're not going to worry with those. So that's chapter seven. We got two more to go after this, and the last three exams are going to be one chapter at a time. It's this one, then chapter eight, and chapter nine, we split up the concept of bonding. So chapter eight is a certain, mostly ionic, some covalent bonding. And then chapter nine, we get into molecular orbitals. Then we're done for this semester. What happened to Julianne? He disappeared.